Savage Lands. Eat, kill, survive. An ancient, primal wilderness, the Savage Lands is a jungle that sprawls far to the west of Wraith. This seemingly endless expanse of dense growth is unrepresented by any map due to its sheer size and the dangers that lie within. It remains untouched by the passage of time as generations of humans try and fail to tame or settle any part of the vast jungle. The first known explorers to survive the Savage Lands described a treacherous and unforgiving landscape filled with hidden dangers and horrific beasts. With no landmarks to mark their passage through the jungle, they found themselves lost within an endless expanse of trees with no way to navigate the jungle. Many members of that first party lost their lives within the wilderness, their corpses left to rot amongst the trees. However, those that survived returned with a wealth of information on the dangers and mysteries of the primordial jungle. From massive predators to vicious scavengers, poisonous fungi to carnivorous plants, the Savage Lands are host to some of the most unique, treacherous, and vile wildlife known to Wraith. Explorers have described being hunted by dark creatures that stalk their prey from the shadows, or watching their fellow adventurers writhe in agony as a deadly toxin spreads through their bloodstream, or trying in vain to hide from some massive, rampaging beast trampling anything that crosses its path. The Savage Lands is a minefield of unknown dangers waiting to claim the lives of the careless and the ill-prepared. Despite the dangers, foolhardy adventurers gather from all over Wraith, attracted by the stories of successful hunts and famed explorers. A growing number of encampments have appeared on the outskirts of the jungle as more adventurers continue to arrive, risking their lives in hope of achieving fame and fortune. The Primal Way The jungle claims the weak, the feeble, and slow. Those who cannot endure, their end feeds the wild. The wild claims the blood, the flesh and bone, feasts upon the dead and the dying all. Where is the kindred of the jungle deep, whose heart still beats somewhere beyond? Predator or prey, kill or be killed. In fear quake all who at death's feet lie. Call of Adventure A vast and mysterious jungle, the Savage Lands attracted many prospective explorers, all eager to discover what lay hidden within its depths. Adventurers who entered would inevitably disappear, their bones abandoned amongst the undergrowth, a legacy of the lost. Occasionally, rumors would surface of some brave adventurer who had re-emerged, telling tall tales of horrific beasts and hidden wonders. Many stepped forward to explore the jungle, and yet no one could survive long enough to bring back information on what lay within. No one, that is, until Theodore Hamilton Scarborough. A researcher who sought to uncover the jungle's secrets, he amassed a large team of mercenaries and explorers and led the first successful expedition into the Savage Lands. Of the original 24 team members, only five would emerge alive. Scarborough wrote at length about his experiences, an account that would soon be published as the first known information on the fauna and flora of the Savage Lands. Deadly Flora Scarborough's notes speak at length of the toxic and poisonous plants that lay within the jungle and the effects that they had upon the people he worked with. Whether it was a team member who decided to try their hand at jungle cuisine, to one man who merely touched a fungus with his hand, he relays their fate with horrifying detail. Convulsing on the ground, foaming at the mouth, eyes rolling back into their skulls as blood seeps from every pore, screaming as they writhe in agony. All of these and more numbered amongst Scarborough's descriptions. Yet not all of the plants found within the Savage Lands seem to have such disastrous side effects. Scarborough hints at the existence of a small number of beneficial and restorative species from the jungle depths, though his work provides only one account of such a plant. 
dangerous fauna. The bestiary notes from Scarborough's work detail an even more horrifying reality, from great scaled beasts with dripping fangs to creatures with crystalline skin and serrated limbs. The creatures in the Savage Lands seem to be nothing short of lethal. Elite predators and monstrous beasts populate the jungle, striking down their prey with deadly accuracy, tearing apart their prey to glean every last scrap of muscle and marrow. Their gaping maws drip with blood, beady eyes gleaming in the dark as they devour the raw flesh of their prey. In the shadows behind them, small scavengers lurk, waiting for the opportunity to pick apart the remains for scraps of muscle and marrow. Primal, aggressive, and deadly, the creatures of the Savage Lands possess traits that make them deadly to anything that crosses their path. It is these exact traits that were the basis for Scarborough's extensive research. Bestiary of Scarborough Theodore Hamilton Scarborough was a prominent researcher who spent his life studying the creatures of the Savage Lands. He was fascinated by the primal instincts of the beasts within the jungles and sought to understand what made these creatures so deadly. Journal Entry Number 6 Day 9 One of the men died this morning fighting off a rather large beast. It moved deathly quick, covered in some form of fur. It nearly decapitated one of the men with its claws. Whilst it did move quickly, I managed to catch a glimpse of its curved beak and of its large, barbed tail, which appeared to have a sort of stinger at the end. Sadly, it seems to have disappeared further into the jungle. I do hope we can manage to find another. Paluda A large creature, the paluda moved surprisingly quickly, given its size, with a thick fur coat interspersed with sharp spikes. Its muscular legs are the source of its apparent speed. Its muscular tail is capable of sweeping any animal off its feet, leaving it vulnerable to the paluda's deadly hooked claws. While the tail appears to have a stinger, further tests have shown that the barb does not contain any form of toxin. Journal Entry Number 8 Day 11 we first spotted this massive creature battling with a much larger, furred beast. While we attempted to avoid catching its eye, it appeared to have followed us. Fire seemed to do the trick for warding it away, and all of the men survived. However, as the creature disappeared, I am left with questions and no specimen. Rekvas A swift and deadly creature, the Rekvas has brightly patterned scales that are highly toxic. Its massive head is framed by some form of hood, brightly colored skin that flares from either side of its neck. Its large fangs and claws are retractable, used not only to attack prey, but to help it tear through the tougher skin of creatures such as the Bronhide. In addition to the toxic coating covering its scales, its teeth can inject a deadly poison into its prey. We retrieved this tooth from the remains of a Rekvas. Unfortunately, we could not risk staying near the carcass long enough to retrieve any samples from the creature. It would seem that the toxin coating its scales also makes the flesh decay at a rapid pace, and the smell was attracting predators. Journal Entry Number 11 Day 18 Today, we encountered a small group of long-legged feathered creatures. Horrid little things. They don't seem afraid of us, but did not attempt to attack either. They seem to have recognized our swords as some form of talon. We weren't sure what they were doing, at first, but one of the men got close enough to see the corpses they were tearing apart with their beaks. I shall see if I can obtain one of these creatures at a later date for dissection. Strix A relatively weak creature, built for speed rather than strength. Strix travel in groups to ensure the safety of the herd. Their long legs allow them to reach incredibly high speeds, their primary form of defense against the jungle's many predators. Feathers cover the majority of a Strix's body, but their soft bellies are protected by a layer of tiny scales. The diet of a Strix is primarily carnivorous, scavenging carcasses of prey left behind by larger predators. Their sharp, hooked beaks allow them to tear even the smallest remnants of flesh and muscle away from carcasses. A highly acidic stomach allows them to digest small bone fragments, swallowed whole. Journal Entry Number 16 Day 23 
Several men died before we had a chance to realize that the creature was upon us. Its hide was smooth and clear, almost appearing crystalline, with sharp teeth that appeared to be made of the same substance. It appeared to have no interest in us, instead directing its attention to the Strixes I had been dissecting. Before the men had a chance to fight it off, it snatched one of the corpses in its mouth, climbed straight up the side of a cliff, and disappeared. Unkis. This crystalline creature does not bleed. It shatters. Its teeth are harder than stone, with serrated edges and a needle-like tip to tear through flesh. Its limbs are long and thin, with sharp points to allow it to grip to most surfaces and scale the difficult terrain of the Savage Lands. Journal Entry Number 19, Day 28 We almost walked straight into one of these. The beast was massive, the height of a man and half again. Its thick hide was covered in fur, two great canines protruding from its mouth, both thick as a man's arm. With great difficulty, we hid in the trees, waiting for hours until the beast finally left. Luckily, it appears to be rather short-sighted. Brawnhide A giant, furred beast with long, thick canines and small, dark eyes. Its long fur protects most of its body, dark gray in color, fading to an off-white at the tips. It appears to make up for its poor sight through its incredibly powerful sense of smell. I have witnessed it track prey through the jungle by scent alone. Their canines are almost impossible to break, both thick and incredibly strong. The Bronhide has a set of claws at the base of their feet, though their feet are far too large and their legs too short for the claws to be of any use. Journal entry number 23, day 32. Only a few of us remain after what happened this morning. Yet another beast attacked us, a ghastly amalgamation of fur and scales. Its four eyes were staring straight at me, blood dripping from its curved fangs, when Thomas had the idea to throw his torch at it. The fire caught immediately. The scent of its burning flesh was very distinctive. It must contain some kind of acidic compound. A toxin, most likely. Skira. One of the Savage Land's most skilled predators, they are almost completely nocturnal, relying on the darkness to help mask their movements while stalking prey. Their four eyes are likely to help it see in the dark in order to hunt its prey. Avoid their poisonous spikes at all costs. The barb at the end of its tail is also highly toxic. Large, muscular creatures with two pairs of eyes and long, curved claws, similar to talons. Skira are covered in a mixture of fur and spikes, patterned with dark, irregular spots. While the spikes do not appear to be poisonous, they do make it rather difficult to dissect. Botanical Compendium Here is the section of Scarborough's notes regarding botanical studies. Despite our best efforts, some of the journal entries have been lost in our attempts to compile his works. Journal entry number four, day six. These brightly colored bushes are found all over the jungle, notable for their thick, glossy red leaves. I took some samples and crushed the leaves into a fine paste, which I then added to one man's gruel. He was dead within minutes, the poor fellow, without even a chance to finish his dinner. Visura. A short, dense bush with thick roots. The leaves of the Visura are poisonous to humans, but most creatures in the Savage Lands are immune to the toxins found within. Its roots, however, are a potent energy source, and safe to eat. One must be absolutely certain to remove every trace of leaves before boiling the root, as the toxins will release into the water and contaminate the entire batch. Pata a vibrant red fungus found within the Savage Lands, it grows in large, flat, parallel formations, somewhat resembling a series of shells. Its brightly colored surface is covered in a thin layer of a deadly neurotoxin, which can cause seizures and death within minutes of skin contact. Using the fungi in any form proves incredibly difficult. Crushing it will cause its toxic spores to release into the air, burning the pata releases toxic smoke, Boiling it contaminates the water. Any alchemist who wishes to use the pata as a poison will struggle to do so without killing themselves. Journal entry number five, day six. 
After the last incident, I did not seek to test this on any of my men. I only have so many, after all. However, Drew was determined to prove it was edible. It's only a mushroom, he said. Toward the end, he began to ramble nonsensically, and while I took notes on what he said, I could not seem to make sense of them. One of the men then tossed the remains of the fungi into the fire without knowledge, after which we all experienced vivid hallucinations. Ochi. A small fungus, characterized by its shiny, jet-black top, protecting the delicate white lace beneath. The lace structure is dangerous when consumed, causing fever, delirium, and eventually, death. When the ochi is burned, it releases a smoke with hallucinogenic and psychoactive properties. Hylan. Found near the base of large trees, Hylan is a small, feathery plant that ranges from pale lilac to a bright violet in color. Perfectly harmless until digested, after which point it will slowly begin to work its way through the body, causing intense pain as the body begins to shut down. Its root system is equally toxic. The hyland spreads through the release of tiny seed pods, which hang from a light, delicate flower. This flower allows the seed pods to be caught by the breeze, allowing them to travel great distances with a single breath of wind. Journal Entry Number 10 Day 17 We lost another of the men this morning. He was walking just in front of me and suddenly tripped over a wayward vine. Quick as lightning, some large leaf snapped out of the shadows and engulfed him, his legs hanging out of its gaping mouth. He immediately began to scream, and we soon realized why. Some kind of substance began dripping from the creature's mouth, and when a few drops hit his leg, they began to dissolve straight through his armor. We managed to escape the area without encountering any more of the plants, though I also failed to gather any specimens. Snapjaw a carnivorous plant with sharp teeth, the leaves of a snapjaw resemble a mouth, lying open in wait until its prey attempts to walk across, triggering its trap. Snapjaw leaves range in size from the length of a hand to near the height of a human. The leaf snaps closed around the creature and begins to excrete a corrosive substance that breaks down the prey, allowing the plant to digest it. Snapjaw plants move incredibly quick once triggered, trapping prey within their barbed leaves. Journal Entry Number 12, Day 19 Simply marvelous! We discovered a cluster of pale blue flowers with thin, blade-like petals. For the longest time, I failed to discover any properties whatsoever. Harold has become quite ill of late, likely the result of losing his hand. With the man on his deathbed, I decided to feed him some petals, as willing subjects were in short supply, and at worst, it could only put an end to the man's agony. Yet before my eyes, the most remarkable thing happened. Within hours, Harold was walking around the campsite as if he'd never been ill at all. I shall have to conduct further studies to test the limits of the plant's apparent healing properties. Winter Gold an extremely rare flower with medicinal properties found in the depths of the Savage Lands. It grows in large clusters near the base of trees with thin, blade-like leaves. The flowers only bloom for two weeks in the middle of winter with pale blue petals and small orange centers. I have struggled to retain any samples of the winter gold. Even removing the plant whole and carrying it in a basket of soil has proven futile as the plant begins to wither within a matter of hours and was dead two days later. I attempted to dry the flowers, preserve them in alcohol, press them, all to no avail. In a moment of desperation, I purchased some lower grade alchemical equipment from a merchant and attempted to create a potion from the flowers on site. That too failed. The flowers of the winter gold are incredibly delicate and wither very quickly upon removal from the plant. If there is a way to successfully preserve them, I have yet to discover it. Journal Entry Number 15, Day 22 We stumbled upon some strange form of plant today. It appeared to be some thin, climbing plant that had taken the shape of a tree. I believe these may once have been smaller vines that grew up the side of a host tree, retaining its shape once the host died. However, even when the tree itself had rotted away, the vines remain, seemingly no worse for wear. I shall search for a smaller sample of this plant, so that I might study its full growth cycle. Thieves' Ladder 
These vines start out small and thin, taking root at the base of a large tree. The plant then begins to climb upward, setting down roots that slowly work their way through the tree bark. Just yesterday, I found a Braunhide skull with one of these vines attached, and the root system had burrowed its way through solid bone. Once established, the thieves' ladder roots then seek out nutrients and water within the host tree as the vines climb up the surface of the tree, weakening the host. Once the host dies, the thieves' ladder is left behind, a shell relying on its own root system to provide water from the soil. One has to wonder, then, if it eventually suffers a similar fate at the hands of another thieves' ladder. Journal Entry Number 18 Day 27 After the success of the winter gold flower with Harold, one of my men demanded to use it as well. Copper has been suffering from some form of respiratory illness as of late. I refused to allow him access to my winter gold samples, and so he decided to consume the glowing berries that we found. I barely had time to realize what he had done before he died. Needless to say, the men will hesitate before disobeying my direct orders again. Kindleweed A plant known for its small, glowing red berries and thorny black leaves. While its colorful berries may appear to be a welcome source of energy, the kindleweed is among some of the most poisonous plants in Wraith. Ingesting just one of these tiny berries can kill an adult human within minutes. Bloodroot Moss A seemingly delicate violet plant with small, soft leaves. However, this invasive species seeks out living creatures rather than soil, absorbing nutrients and glucose from their blood. Adult plants produce an abundance of fine, airborne seeds, which are easily carried on the wind. Once they land in a creature's fur or skin, they will sprout thin roots, which work their way through the creature's skin in search of blood. The plant will then begin to spread very rapidly, coating the animal in moss. Journal Entry Number 20, Day 29 The trees of this jungle are far more hardy than those found anywhere else in Wraith, putting down large roots to aid survival. Many of the jungle's fiercest predators lurk within their branches, watching their prey from above, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. They have dense wood, which, although difficult to light, can burn for hours at a time once properly stoked. One fire exceeded temperatures found in any forge or factory I have visited to date. Druden The wood of this tree is incredibly dense, making it one of the strongest and most viable trees in the Savage Lands. Their branches grow in unusual, twisted shapes with broad leaves to soak up any available sunlight. The leaves, while bitter, are non-poisonous. Halder A large, slow-growing tree with an incredibly thick trunk. The favored nesting ground of multiple species of birds, Halder trees can survive for hundreds of years and are often used as shelters due to their roots lifting off the ground once they begin to mature. Stoneberry Tree with long, thin trunks and massive leaves, the stoneberry tree is somewhat of an oddity. Its berries are very large and hard as stone. Falling stoneberries are more than capable of crushing bone and have decapitated more than one unsuspecting adventurer. Hecklers Perhaps hecklers were once human, lost within the jungles long ago. Left to fend for themselves in an unforgiving landscape, they left behind their humanity in order to survive. Hecklers are ruthless, feral, and violent, attacking anything that crosses their path. They travel in small groups, wearing makeshift armor made from leather and furs. Groups of hecklers have been known to ambush traveling parties, raiding their corpses for anything useful, taking weapons, tools, food, or other supplies. First Encounter on one of his expeditions, Scarborough and his crew were taking an opportunity to rest when a group of feral humans ambushed them just before dawn. This was the first recorded encounter with hecklers, thus named by Scarborough for their quick and quiet attacks. It is my experience that hecklers rarely seek true confrontation. Like tiny birds, they flit in, snatch what they desire, and disappear just as quickly as they had arrived. Despite my best efforts, I have failed to encounter many hecklers, only catching glimpses on the occasion that they ambush my crew. Of course, this could not begin to compare to Scarborough's next encounter with a sentient creature inside the jungle. On the very same expedition, his campsite was once again ambushed. 
yet this time the experience was markedly different. A pack of great hulking beasts came charging out of the trees. They were one and again the size of my largest man, with thick hides and beady red eyes. I barely had time to escape with my life. I witnessed several of the beasts hunched over one of my men, tearing open his flesh with their bare hands, entrails hanging from their gaping maws. While I fled, their screams followed me, echoing through the trees. After this encounter, Scarborough managed to escape the jungle alive and soon returned on another expedition. In later years, he returned home to pursue his research and conduct experiments based around his time in the Savage Lands. It is these experiments that led to the creation of the Invalesco Serum and the work that would make him famous across all of Wraith. Brutes These massive beasts are vicious, bloodthirsty, and incredibly hostile. Brutes are deeply territorial and one of the deadliest creatures within the Savage Lands. They tower over all humans, almost double the height of the average man and the muscle mass to match. Their immense strength and violent natures make them incredibly dangerous opponents. While sentient, they are slow and unintelligent, relying mainly on strength and brute force to decimate their prey. They often collect trophies from their fallen prey, from small skulls tied onto their armor to locks of hair or ears attached to a belt, or armor decorated with hides and fur. Legends and Fools Tales of Scarborough's time in the jungle have attracted adventurers from all over Wraith, drawn by the tale of monstrous beasts and incredible battles. The allure of the untamed wilderness proves impossible to resist for many, a mysterious region filled with legendary creatures. One after another, would-be heroes arrive to challenge the wilds within. For some, it is a chance to prove one's own abilities, pitted against dangerous beasts and the jungle itself in a savage battle to the death. For others, it is a chance for fame, to reach the legendary status that Scarborough has achieved. Yet others arrive seeking fortune, pursuing the lucrative contracts offered by corporations, researchers, and those wishing to cull the beasts within. Forward Camps Forward camps have appeared along the jungle outskirts, small makeshift towns of ramshackle huts and tents built by merchants looking to profit from the high demand for supplies. The clever trader sets up contracts with the scientific community back home, taking requests from biomancers and alchemists in advance. Then the trader buys several wagons worth of supplies and travels to the forward camps, where they set up shop and get settled in. While there, they can not only sell supplies to those who come through, but buy samples and specimens from those returning from the jungle. Once they've acquired all of the items on their list, they simply pack up shop and return home to sell their goods at inflated prices. The system has become the groundwork for a network of forward camps scattered along the perimeter of the Savage Lands. Adventurers will trek into the jungle, see what they can salvage, and return to the forward camps to sell to merchants seeking samples from within the jungle. There are also a growing number of mercenaries who travel to the forward camps looking to accept a contract on a particular beast. These creatures are often difficult to find and incredibly dangerous, but for those willing to risk their lives, these contracts are also incredibly lucrative. Some researchers come to the Savage Lands themselves, setting up the forward camps to make contracts directly. Occasionally, one particularly reckless researcher may decide to employ a small team of hired hands and enter the jungle themselves. Sometimes, this is to study their field of research hands-on, looking at plants and creatures in their natural environment. Sometimes, this is because they are searching for a rare item, one that only an expert could identify. Other times, it is to conduct their experiments somewhere secluded, where nobody can hear the screaming. Of course, not everyone who comes to the Savage Lands is a trader, researcher, or fortune seeker. The Knights of Solana are also a regular site within the camps, helping with defense and exchange for a safe place to rest in between patrols. These knights pursue a nobler cause, hunting down the beasts within in order to protect the villages that lie beyond the outskirts of the Savage Lands. Those venturing into the jungle must be well prepared. Whether a mercenary, explorer, or a knight, those who enter the Savage Lands all carry the same essential items. <laughs>